for joining us. Um, the reason I've given the, this title to our to our talk this evening is because we probably all read that Laudato Deum, that's what I'm abbreviating to LD, is like a part two of Laudato C, or Laudato Deum is a clone of Laudato C. Laudato C was published eight years ago, Laudato Deum was only published this year, and many people think that it's just Pope Francis repeating what he's already said in the, the, the encyclical Laudato C. But I'm, I'm going to hope to demonstrate to us today that there has been a change, there's been a shift, there's been a progression in papal teaching, and that the one is not simply a part two of the other or a continuation of the other. So Laudato C, as you know, was published eight years ago. It was Pope Francis's um, mainstreaming of ecological concerns in Catholic theological awareness. Obviously, Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, before Pope Francis, had mentioned um, environmental concerns. And these environmental concerns uh, also featured quite prominently in the Orthodox churches and Orthodox teaching. But Pope Francis in Laudato Si mainstreamed. He said this concern for the environment is something which is central to Christian and therefore Catholic um, morality. Um, Laudato Si released a lot of energy uh, among Catholics. It motivated many of us to think and to pray and to act in care of God's creation. It brought a lot of contemporary science, particularly environmental science, into Catholic social teaching. And remember, if you're trying to do ethics, good ethics is dependent on good science. You can't kind of be ethical if you've got a completely wrong scientific paradigm or if you're not understanding what's going on in the science, in the basic science. So that's the encyclical Laudato Si. Laudato Deum is an apostolic exhortation. It's a call to action. Pope Francis is calling us to action with Laudato Deum. And that's, that's what... Um, that's what this latest document is about. You remember it was published only last month on the 4th of October, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, and it's a real urgent call for us to focus on global climate change. In fact, it presents climate change as a crisis, a crisis which is deepening and which is getting kind of more and more widespread. And Pope Francis analyzes why the crisis is deepening, and he urges all people of goodwill to make changes, profound changes, in our domestic, in our cultural, and our national activities. Laudate Deum is not a big, long theological document. Laudate Deum is a call to action. Both are loosely structured on the pastoral cycle. And if you don't know what the pastoral cycle is, it's, it's a way of looking at the way Christians look at the world. We see, so the first step is to see, we see some activity, we see some problem in the world. We kind of do a judgment, a theological judgment, a social judgment, a judgment about the science, trying to understand what's going on. And then once we understand fully what's going on and we've got a kind of biblical idea of what God would want us to do, we act. And so the pastoral cycle is based on observation, and it's based on our, theolo our theology, our Christian understanding, and it's a call to action. And once we do some activity, once we address the, the issue or the pastoral problem at hand, we act. And then that then brings around a new situation, something new for us to see, something that we can see and say, this, is, this has got to change. I'm now going to see was, as I said, it's an encyclical letter. It was published in 2015. It's got 56 pages. So it's a fairly thick document, as you see here, 56 pages. It's got 172 end notes. And so it's a long theological discourse. And it's it was groundbreaking in its time. Um, I'll quickly go through the C Judge Act so it begins with an introduction. We see what's happening in our common home. Then we do a judgment, as you see here, on three different levels, a faith analysis, a social analysis, and analysis from the principles of Catholic social teaching. 
So if chapter one looks at what's happening in our common home, chapter two talks about the gospel of creation, the faith analysis. Chapter three looks at where the crisis is coming from, the human roots of the ecological crisis. And chapter four presents us with integral ecology. It's not just about the environment, it's the way the environment and human society mix together. And so we've got a lot of teaching in the Christian tradition about improving human society or making it a more just space for everybody. So if the first part is C, the second three chapters are judging, the last two chapters are about action. Action, Pope Francis says the very first thing we have to do is dialogue. We have to dialogue with everybody, not just people who have the same faith background as ourselves, not just people of goodwill, but we have to dialogue with everybody who's living on this planet. So that's chapter five there. In chapter six, Pope Francis, the second part of the action, says that we have to educate ourselves, we have to educate our children, we have to allow ourselves to learn about what's going on in our common home. And education is one thing, but education should go deeper than that. It should go into our very, very spirit, our very sense of who we are in relation to the world and in relation to the environment and our brothers and sisters and our relationship to God. Education is not just a head trip. It has to come down into the heart and the spirit and the soul as well. And so the last two chapters, chapters five and six, have to do with activity, action to change the world. And if we're living kind of our spirituality, then it makes practical demands on the way we live. Our spirituality compels us to act in ways that are more just towards the environment. And then to top that section on spirituality, Pope Francis gives us two prayers a prayer for our earth, which anyone can pray, you needn't be a Christian. And then the second prayer is a prayer of Christians in un union with creation. And so we have, this, so then the two prayers take us over to a new moment of seeing. Our activity, our spiritual, our spiritual and physical activity takes us to a new situation. And then the cycle begins again. And so this is a pastoral cycle. So if Laudato Si is structured on Si Judge Act, I propose or I suggest to you that Laudate Deum is also structured around the Si Judge Act um, routine in Catholic theology. It's a much, much smaller document. It's only 12 pages long. It's got 44 end notes. We've got the end notes at the back here. There are only 44 end notes. And most of these end notes, or at least half of the end notes, are quotations directly from Laudato Si, from the previous encyclical which Pope Francis wrote about the environment. Laudate Deum is focusing specifically on the climate crisis. It's not addressing all of the other um, ecological and environmental issues. It's focusing specifically on the climate crisis and focusing towards one particular activity which is going to begin at the end of this month, that is the 28th meeting of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So Pope Francis is writing this with a particular goal in mind. This narrow document, this thin document, is focusing on COP28, which is going to take place later this month. Again, it's based on the Sea Judge Act movement or dynamic. We see what's happening, the global climate crisis. We see people resisting. We see people being confused. We see the human causes. And Pope Francis is quite unequivocal that it's humanity which is causing the global climate crisis. It's not about cyclical changes in the, in the environment or things like that. It's entirely about, um, it's entirely about um, I wonder whether Martin, I wonder whether people would mute their, mute their microphones, please. There will be a time afterwards when we can discuss with each other. But, so Pope Francis is unequivocal that it's the human activity which is the cause of the global climate change. So we see what's going on. We judge, we judge what's, what's the cause of this. And he talks about our, particularly since the, the um, 
Industrial Revolution 200, about 200 years ago, that people are becoming more and more and more technological and technocratic and thinking that technology is the solution to all of our, all of our human issues, all of our problems. We can invent, we can kind of make, we can make the world a better place using technology. In fact, he says that technology has its ch challenges and poses enormous challenges. Particularly, we have to rethink about power and what we want to do as human beings with power, which the technology places at our disposal. Um, and another moment of judgment is that we have to see that international or multilateral organizations have not met the expectations which the world has of them. The United Nations is brilliant. It's an important organization, but the United Nations is lacking teeth. It doesn't have ways to kind of bind countries to, to really undertake their commitments or to live up to the commitments which they undertake on the national, on the international stage. So Pope Francis says we have to get more and more civil societies and ordinary, ordinary human beings like you and me, I guess, involved in helping the United Nations to fulfill its task. So international politics has been really weak and we need to strengthen that. So those are two kind of uh, kind of two social judgments he's given about the situation. Then he says we need to act. The first moment of action that he's going to point us towards is the COP28, the meeting of all the countries in the world which have subscribed to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's taking place in in um, in uh, United Arab Emirates beginning at the end of this month. And there've been lots and lots of these climate change conferences. Some of them have been good, some of them have been weak, some of them have made very, very excellent resolutions, but there have been failures in the implementation of these, of these climate change conferences. And so we can go to uh, to Abu Dhabi, this in to Dubai this month with expectations, with high expectations. And so these two chapters or these two sections of the exhortation relates to activity action. And then as he did with Laudato Deum, he gives us a Christian way of understanding. He gives us prayer and he gives us spirituality and how we understand all of this in the light of our faith. So we've got a similar kind of circular movement, see, judge, act, see, judge, act in Laudato Deum. So although the two may have the similar structure, one is not a clone of the other. Laudato Si, let's just go back a bit in history. Laudato Si was groundbreaking. Um, Pope Francis makes a very strong connection between the, the ecological crisis and the, and the social crisis, saying that they're two sides of the same coin. We're not talking about two different crises. He's saying that the ecological and the, and the social crises are so interconnected. And Laudato Si introduced readers to the notion of integral ecology, that everything is connected in what, what we sometimes call nature, in the environment, in what's going on in society, what's going on in the cities, what's going out in, on in the villages, what's happening at kind of the molecular level, in, in our, in our um, atmosphere, what's happening in the oceans, everything is connected. We can't deal with things in isolation. So that's why he's calling it integral. Everything in ecology is integrated with everything else. Laudato Si gave us a profound spirituality of creation, and I'll discuss that towards the end because there are connections between Laudato Si and Laudate Deum about spirituality of creation. Laudato Si quoted Episcopal conferences from around the world, bishops speaking or the church speaking, the hierarchical church speaking around the world about urban and natural environments. I'm very proud that the very first quotation in Laudato Si is of the Southern African Catholic Bishops Conference. Southern African Catholic Bishops talking about the environmental crisis and that kind of features right at the beginning of Laudato Si. Pope Francis in Laudato Si consulted the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences. He consulted leading sciences around the world and he focused on leading issues or the most prominent issues of environmental uh, collapse 
in the world, and he was led by, or he was kind of informed by the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences. And then Laudato Si was influential in the outcome of the Paris COP21, the COP held in Paris in, 20, in 2015. And so it was, it was a groundbreaking document. Laudato Si considers nine, six of the nine planetary boundaries. So this is the science, the science bit and how science has informed Laudato Si in the Pope's thinking. We must remember that he himself is trained as a scientist. He himself was trained as a chemist before he went into priestly training, before he became a bishop and then a, and then a pope, et cetera, et cetera. He has a background in science. So he understands a lot of the science of what's going on at the planetary level, kind of at the, at the planetary level. Um, he deals with climate change. He deals with biodiversity loss, otherwise known as biosphere integrity. These paragraph, these are paragraph numbers of what's happening or where you might find these, these particular issues discussed in Laudato Si. So paragraph 169, paragraph 24, etc. He deals with freshwater pollution and the commodification of fresh water, which is a basic human right, and yet the poorer people in the world are less and less able to afford this basic human right of fresh water. He deals with biogeochemical changes, so chemical changes in the, in the whole atmosphere, particularly carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, most of them related to the fertilizer industry. He deals with the change in land systems, the change in the way in land is used, deforestation, desertification, and invasion of wetlands. And we see wetlands being invaded more and more commonly. I've watched it happen in Nairobi in the last 10 years, uh, where people build shopping malls in what were previously wetlands. And that means that this land system is being, is being destroyed. And then he talks also about air pollution, particularly in the scientific terms, atmospheric aerosol loading. These are the, or this is the kind of the scientific rather than the narrative representation of what Pope Francis is writing about. This is from, this is known as planetary boundary theory. And you can see, well, I mean, those of you who are familiar with it, you can see that Pope Francis deals with six out of these nine um, planetary boundaries. I'm not going to go into that in detail, but the one that he concentrates on in Laudate Deum, the apostolic exhortation, is this one here right at the top, climate change. It looks like, or at least the scientists are saying that we're, we're in a kind of safe fish zone. We haven't yet gone into this red zone here, but Pope Francis is saying our concern about, about climate change must really, really spur us to greater action. Now, Dr. C, I would maintain, is prophetic. The prophet always speaks on behalf of God. The prophet expresses God's concern for the environment or for the world, for the people. And so Pope Francis is speaking about God's concern for the cosmic dimension of human's life. And the concern is about human well-being. Firstly, primarily, humans need a space in which to thrive. And as that space is being destroyed, human thriving is, is being um, undermined. The prophet is very often countercultural. The prophet is very often resisted or not accepted when he speaks. And we saw resistance to Laudato Si. Who is this Pope? Who does he think he is telling us about ecology, about economy? Who does this Pope? He should stick to the sacristy. He should stick to saying mass and praying the rosary. We saw responses like that. And so his countercultural voice was resisted at some levels. The prophet is concerned with the future. He's not concerned with prophesying what's going to go on in 100 years' time or 50 years' time. The present has implications for future generations. And so the prophet speaks about what's going on here and now, the ills of society, the ills of the world here and now. The prophet generally calls for conversion. And the prophet's words are, because they're sort of tied to the present, they're necessarily incomplete. They're never going to be the final word. So Laudato Si could never be the final word on the environmental crisis and the environmental problems. Um, 
some people I've heard recently criticized Laudato Si because it doesn't specifically address women's issues, but it doesn't specifically address men's issues either. So uh, there is a feminist critique of Laudato Si, but I think there should also be a critique from the side of men because it doesn't specifically address men's issues. So Laudato Si has been groundbreaking. Laudato, Laudate Deum is extremely urgent. It talks about the urgency of the climate crisis. He, right at the beginning of the, of, the, of the exhortation, Pope Francis mentions how during the last eight years, the climate crisis has worsened. It's got more acute. Um, the effects of the climate change are being felt around the world, and it's particularly the poor who are feeling the effects, particularly the poor who are exposed to flooding, they're exposed to drought, they're exposed to um, the rains, and they're exposed to the things that Sister Jane was talking about at the beginning of this meeting, the wetness, the, um, the El Nino effect, especially the poor are suffering from the, the immediate effects of climate change. Um, Pope Francis, has no doubt that climate change is due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases. He is not entertaining any other reason for global climate change. He talks about biodiversity loss, which is accompanying climate change as parts of our continent, Africa, for example, are becoming more and more deserted. Um, then they're less able to host the, the biodiversity which would normally have lived in marginal, marginal lands and things like that. And so climate change and biodiversity loss go hand in hand. Again, Pope Francis observes how there's been widespread resistance worldwide or globally for, of people to change their lifestyles economies are entrenched, economies, global economies are entrenched and they're not changing. And economies need to change if climate change is to be reduced or addressed. Laudato Deum mentions that this often repeated myth that climate change can be reversed with technology. Pope Francis says that this is a myth. This technocratic paradigm is not helpful the misuse of technology over the last 200 years is what has caused the crisis. He also writes that technology can end up in the wrong hands. We just need to look at Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Hamas, and to see that technology, namely the use of rockets, is really in the wrong hands and technology can be incredibly destructive. So if we think that we can just apply technology to, to change climate change or to reverse climate change, Pope Francis says we're living, he doesn't say this, I'm saying, we're living in a fool's, a fool's paradise. Um, he, in, the, in the exhortation, he says that international politicians or international politics haven't grasped the nettle of climate change. They make nice, important speeches. They make all sorts of um, public commitments, but really the nettle hasn't been grasped. And he says it's only when the United Nations has more has more um, risk, when it has more ability to impose what countries commit themselves to in public, when the civil society participates in a meaningful way in the United Nations, only when that happens, when the United Nations can compel compliance, or when civil societies compel their government to comply to their commitments, that there will be real progress. Um, Pope Francis looks at these annual climate change conferences. They've had mixed outcomes. The resolutions are great, but the implementation is poor and there has been insufficient oversight. There haven't been sufficient reviews or penalties and not enough is being done. Then Pope Francis ends the, the, um, the, the act part of the, of the exhortation on a high note. He's saying that COP28 is about to take place. He himself will be present at COP28, the first time a Pope is ever attending one of these COP meetings. A COP is a conference of the parties, the signatories of that climate change convention. Um, the resolutions coming from the COP must be effective. They must be obligatory and they must be monitorable, easily monitored. 
I've just put in number 59 here, he uses a theological term, climate change is an evil. And it's the first time, he didn't use that word in Laudato Si, it's the first time he's saying that this physical thing is an evil. It's coming from a bad space. Um, he says we have to think of the common good of the present and of future. We've got this uh, intergenerational solidarity. We have to look to the future. We have to be concerned about our, our children. And the future must take priority over short-term interests of certain countries and certain businesses. We cannot continue with business as usual, profit-making as usual. We have to think of the children of the future and the world that they're going to be growing up in. As always, our as Catholics, as we're reading the as we're reading the the exhortation, our faith should inform our actions, and then ultimately, in the last bit, the spirituality bit. A lot of the spirituality of creation, which is announced in Laudato Si, a lot of that spirituality of creation is repeated in Laudate Deo. There are other agendas on climate on COP28. The first one is the monetization or the making, making amends, financial amends to those countries which have been most affected, but which have contributed least to, to climate change and to global greenhouse gases. Um, the Pope will for the first time attend a COP meeting. And it's it's in the cycle of the Paris Climate Accord, that a global stock take must be made. A global stock take must be made of the 2015 Climate Accord, uh, where countries committed themselves to rising of temperature not more than one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. So that's going to be taking place. That's kind of the first thing on the agenda. Um, there will be discussions about the loss and damage fund the fund which is supposed to compensate countries which are which are suffering loss and damage because of global climate change. There'll be discussions on the mobilization of climate finance. How will it be, how will it be monitored? How will it be administered? At the moment, proposals are that it should be administered by the World Bank, but there, there are difficulties with the World Bank as an, as an institution. Where does it get its funding? How it disperses its funding? So that will be on the agenda of COP28. Importantly, talking about the phasing out of fossil fuels, but there should be a just energy transition. In a country like South Africa, for example, Nigeria, we can think of, many, many people depend on the economy of, of the, the, the value chain relating to fossil fuels. If we just cut coal and petrochemicals completely, then many of those people in the value chain lose their jobs. And so the energy transition should be a just transition where people are not left unemployed. Um, we have to help countries parts of countries, regions, to adapt to climate change. Climate change is a reality. Climate change is happening. How do we help societies to become more resilient and to adapt to what's happening in their area? Of course, we have climate change refugees, people who are already running away from where they live because they simply, or they lived, because they simply cannot live there anymore. But how do we help people to adapt, societies to adapt to climate change, which is affecting them? And then another item on the agenda is talking about food and where food and agriculture contribute to climate change and to the to the worsening of the climate. How do we make food, particularly um, agriculture, ex um, less destructive? You can find the agenda, which is set by the by the president of the COP. You can find it here at the, this website. You can find a discussion of the agenda at the Chatham House website. Um, I'll leave those two up for a minute. So you can go to cop28.com to find what the agenda is. And you can go to Chatham House for a discussion of the, of the agenda. A bit of the spirituality, which is common to Laudato Si and Laudate Deum. Spirituality, as I said, affects who we are at our very, very deepest level. We did not make ourselves. We have to live with a certain humility. I'm created by God in the image and likeness of God. I didn't make myself. I'm not responsible for my own being. And this appears in both the, 
encyclical and the exhortation. Both of the, both of the documents begin with praise God, praise be God, praise God for the gift of life, praise God for everything God has given us, praise God for, for the universe, praise God for creation. Both of them actually begin with the word either in Italian or in, in Latin, praise be God for what God has been given us. So that sense of praise and thanksgiving should be right there on our lips at the beginning when we think of, of the environment. We, we should have awe and wonder. The creation is so in, enormous, so big, so beyond our understanding, so formidable that we can only stand in awe and wonder of everything that God has, all the marvels God has put into creation. God, there's a sense of obedience. Our spirituality has to be a spirituality of obedience. We have what Catholic theology calls natural law. God has put things there for a purpose. God has created all creatures for a purpose. God has created you and me for a purpose. And so if we live according to the way God, is, God has written the law in our hearts, then we're living in obedience. And that should be part of our spiritual approach as well. Solidarity. We should feel the pain of the death of every creature not only solidarity with human beings and solidarity between human generations, but somehow the death of the earth and the suffering of the earth and the suffering of creatures should touch me because we are interdependent. Nothing in the world can happen without having some in impact on I'm me. Better than here, but I can't get on my computer. As human beings. Um, Justice, obviously justice should be part of our spirituality and justice for the most vulnerable in human society and the most vulnerable in, in natural in natural world. So a sense of justice, particular care for the most vulnerable. Uh, in Catholic tradition, we call it God's preferential option for the poor or for the weak. The spirituality of reconciliation. I need to be reconciled to the world. I need to befriend the world and allow the world to become not a challenge, not a threat to me, but the whole of created reality must be my friend. And I need to be reconciled to the world. I'm not dominant over the world. I'm not created or human beings. We're not created to sub, sub submit the world to our power or anything like that. That's a bad reading of Genesis chapter one. We're supposed to be there as stewards of the world, friends reconciled to our environment. Um, there's a spirituality of consistency, what we call, or what in theology call, they call the seamless garment. Every part of my spirituality should express itself in my action. What I say and what I pray and what I do should all be consistent. We need to convert in our lifestyles as well as in our minds and our understanding, our theology, there should be consistency in our spirituality. In our culture, um, global culture, national culture, our domestic culture, the culture in our communities and our families needs to change. We waste less, we consume less, we think about what we do, maybe we use public transport rather than rather than private individual transport. There's all sorts of cultural changes which come out of our concern for the environment. And Pope Francis ultimately ends in Laudato Laudate Deum that we need to be patient. Healing the world will take decades. It's taken hundreds of years for us to get to the point where the globe is so damaged. It'll take decades and decades and decades, possibly even centuries, before our world is healed and global, global climate change is no longer a threat. So there are some aspects of the spirituality of Laudato Si and Laudate Deum. I want to end with some responses we have from the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences of Africa and Madagascar. So the African bishops gathered together um, last month, responding to Laudate Deum. They published a response to the, to the, to the exhortation. SICAM, that's the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences, appeals to world leaders to prioritize ways to reduce carbon emissions carbon emissions which are adversely affecting the environment, carbon emissions which are responsible for global climate change. And so they're making a big request here 
that all countries adopt the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. That is, we stop going and getting more oil and more coal and digging up, getting in more gases and things like that. We stop proliferating fossil fuels. As there's a global compact not to, not to proliferate nuclear arms, uh, fossil fuels are just as dangerous to the to the environment, just in, as dangerous to human survival and well-being. And so the bishops of Africa and Madagascar are calling on all countries no longer to um, look for to exploit new um, new resources in fossil fuels. The bishops are saying that biodiversity is collapsing in front of our very eyes. And this has disastrous consequences because the whole bio, the whole food chain is going to collapse as well as biodiversity gets more and more weak. And this has implications for us. It has major implications for future generations. Here is a little quote from the CCAM document. Economic policies must prioritize, so economies must prioritize efforts to accelerate the reduction of emissions through just transition processes. Remember, we can't leave people behind. Everybody should be involved or participate in the transition to a fossil fuel free in economy. And we have to operationalize. So the bishops are talking about the loss and damage fund. We have to find ways to operationalize that in a just way. Pope Francis says, the longer we wait, the more burdensome the cost will be to our economies, to our countries, to our families, to our children and our children's children. So the bishops of Africa and Madagascar quote that. I want to end with a quote that Pope Francis uses from the bishops of Africa and Madagascar in 2022. So the bishops made a statement that climate change will make manifest or does make manifest a striking and tragic example of structural sin. So climate change is structural sin. It's about injustice. It's about kind of people taking more than they possibly can use and wasting the resources of the planet. And so as the bishops quote Pope Francis, Pope Francis in Laudate Deum is quoting the bishops of Africa and Madagascar. And I think I shall end there. I thank you for your patience. Um, Rampe, would you like to take over? Thank you, Ndade Knox. Uh, okay. So we thank you for that for that uh, uh, exposition, and uh, and without wasting any further time, we will ask uh, for people who are interested in asking questions uh, to indicate if they want to ask questions. Any questions, Pas Pascal? Yes, please. Maybe Thank you. Uh, Pascal, if if maybe you could uh, just introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, and then uh, ask your question, please. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Reverend Father Pascal Mokio. I'm from Kenya. And my area of specialization is bioethics. And we can see how the issues of climate change are related to, to bioethics. My question is, in trying to reduce the emissions which are affecting the climate globally, the green the greenhouse emissions, fossils, would it be prudent to engage even the engineers behind this technology? Because technology is not going backwards, it is ever forward, so that in coming up with new innovations, they can try to see how technology itself can help minimize these emissions. Because what has been damaged so far as you say, it will take time. We need patience. We need prudence. We need justice. But I think also going forward, it could be prudent that we engage even the engineers themselves behind the innovations so that they can 
try and help minimize this uh, in, for the sake of even the future generations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Pascal. Um, certainly, we need to use science. We have to understand science. We have to apply science. Um, science is, is, is essential. Um, for us to firstly understand what's going on, what's going wrong, and then we have to uh, harness science or employ science, engage science, and you speak about, about biochemistry, we can find different fuels, for example, which are not fossil fuels, but using, using algae, for example, to produce, uh, to produce oils or to produce kind of fuels which are not being dug out from underground. Um, we cannot approach this without, without the use of science and technology and the engineers who understand everything that's going on on a global scale. But Pope Francis is warning us not to think that science has all the answers. He's warning us against what he calls the technological paradigm, as though technology has all the answers and only technology can change things. So we can continue our lifestyle as normal, trusting that technology like carbon capture and sequestration is going to solve everything. We know that some plants can capture and sequester carbon, carbon dioxide, more than other plants. And so we have to plant more and more of these forests rather than those forests. But Francis is saying we have to change our lifestyle as well. We can't just say technology is going to deal with everything on our behalf. There has to be some personal investment, some national investment, some domestic or community investment in changing the way we approach the world, changing the, the, the idea that the world is just there to give, 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 and provide everything that we think we need in order to continue our lifestyle. So yes, we need the science, we need those who understand the science and who can implement it, but we also need to kind of understand that we have our role to play, even if we're not scientists. Okay, so thank you, Father Pascal. I think that's that's my answer to your question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. I agree with you that technology does not give, uh, uh, although it gives solution, but doesn't give the truth and the goodness. Thank you. Mm, exactly. Thank you. There are values like truth and goodness, for example, which are not really expressed in technology. There's another hand there. Uh, is that Pascal? Okay. No. Is it a different one? That is... Uh... It's a legacy hand. I need to lower it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> a legacy hand. I like that. Uh, then there's a Godion, Frederic, is it Fred Frederico. Yes, this is Gideon from Ekima. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Actually, today in our class of Catholic social teaching for the day, we had a presentation on these two encyclicals. So I'm very happy today. Mm. I think I'm very nourished. Um, I hear in those two encyclicals, especially in uh, Laudato Deo, two interesting things. The intergenerational dialogue and intragenerational dialogue. So we don't think only for the future generation, but here and now. I would like to hear you uh, saying with practical words, how can we develop this intergenerational uh, conversation in practical ways, apart these official meetings, which a uh, few people attend, and then some decision which are taken, they don't uh, uh, get roots to be implemented. How can we start in the grassroots in order to have an effective action. Thank you. Uh, Peter, okay, thank you. Wait, before you answer, yes. the, can, can you take a second one and answer them, uh, try to answer them together? I'm just okay, conscious of time. Maybe so yeah, we have a, another hand there, 9011674. Please go ahead with the question. So who is that? Is that me? Yes, yes. That's you, yes. It, it, it shows numbers. 
Oh, am I, am I a number now? <laughs> it's Sorry, Tony, I'm... hey? Yeah, is it me? Yes, okay. yes, it's your turn. Please All ask right. the question. I think in a way, I probably connect a little bit with Gideon on the intragenerational dialogue, but coming from a different direction, um, the a point that came, that I picked up from Peter's talk was from in, in Laudate Deum, that politics is not going to solve the problem, that civil society has to get involved and take responsibility. And so, you know, I would like to suggest, of course, that we, we, and, and the other comment about there's nothing about women or there's nothing about men, but I think we need, for me, we need to look more holistically that we look at civil societies made up of families or people in relationships. And even that links to the spirituality where God is a community as well. So um, I would like to see more, like we're talking about in, in the document, politics um, is, is, is coming short because civil society, you, you know, the layered, well, let's say, let's say civil society is not getting involved. But from the church's perspective, CCAM is doing the same thing. It seems to me that we're dealing with hierarchy, with um, theologians, with, you know, with, with educated people. I, I'm really an ordinary lay person, so I feel uncomfortable saying all this stuff. But 99%, in fact, everybody is living in relationships, in family structures. And so why are we not thinking of ways to bring the spirituality and the application, the action, the call to action needs to come down to people on the ground. And is that not where things like the Laudata Si Action Platform or the Laudata Si Movement should be mobilized quite strongly by the, can I say, hierarchical or official church. Okay. Does that make sense? I'm sure it, yes, does. it does. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, and let me answer both of you. Um, I think Laudato Si, firstly, Gideon, this one here uh -huh. is, a, is an encyclical. Uh -huh. Can you see here, encyclical? Yeah. Yeah. It's encyclical. The other one is what's called an apostolic exhortation. It's an exhortation. So these are different types of documents. This is a call to action. It's right. not a big, thick document. It's a short document, a call to action. Uh, guys, we need to move forwards. And I would mention um, that I've been writing at a popular level. And so we have to popularize this. As Tony says, yeah. and Gideon as well, we have to bring it to the people in their homes, in their parishes. I've been writing magazine articles and not high-flowing academic articles, but magazine articles which have been distributed around Eastern Africa. I've been fortunate enough to have a platform in a magazine called New People where we take little lessons at a time. And I know Tony does a lot of um, popular publication as well. And we, that's, we have to get it into people's homes. We have to get it into families so that families can read this. And we can't use big, high theological language or academic language. It has to come to where people are experiencing it, um, where they decide, what am I going to do with this plastic container? Am I just going to throw it away or am I going to recycle it? This glass bottle, this, this metal tin or something like that. Um, it has to come to where people are living day to day. Um, yeah. From the hierarchy's point of view, there's the Laudato Si week, uh, sorry, and there's the season of creation. Both of these are trying to mainstream, and certainly the, um, the Orthodox Church and the Anglican Church have had the season of creation, a whole liturgical season, uh, most of the whole of the month of September, leading up to uh, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, where priests and parishioners and everybody in the, in the church situation is encouraged to say 
How do we care for creation? Priests are encouraged to think in their homilies. How can I encourage parishioners to take greater care of their environments? I know the Jesuit Institute, where I now work, we've got a plan of action for Laudato Si Week next year, and we've got a plan of action for the season of creation next year, where we hope to get into people's homes and get into people's people's certainly the schools and the academies as well but really to take it home to ordinary people um gideon's question is dialogue at an intra-generational level that's within a single generation and an intergenerational level i think part of the big problem at the moment is that young people are so so um dis graced or so unhappy with the way elder generation is using the goods of the earth and young people many of them have what's called climate anxiety because they can feel it's their future which is on the line old people like tony and me we're going to be dead in 20 years time or 30 years time whereas young people will be will be living with the consequences of my generation um, so there's young people are finding it difficult and they want to take over and they want to be active in in um, care for the care for our home. We have the Fridays for the Future movement, for example, with this, this Swedish girl Greta Thunberg, but it's gone around the world where young people are saying, we have to tell our old folk or our, our elders to really do something and do it seriously because they are the decision makers. They are the ones who wield what Pope Francis calls power. They are the powerful, and these are the ones who have to actually do something about it. So that's intra-generational dialogue. We have to listen more to the young people, um, those of us who have decision-making um, roles at the moment. We have to listen and think about the future. Inter, so intragenerational, that means within, within your generation, Gideon, within the generation of Father Rampe, he's kind of 10 years younger than me, within my generation, within Tony's generation, we really should be talking to our peers, talking to one another and encouraging one another to take this climate change seriously. Um, so I don't think we need to be caught up in the difference or the distinction between intra and intergenerational we really have to talk and that's what chapter five of laudato c is about scientists have to listen to the concerns of the general public we have to listen to what scientists are saying that's kind of dialogue is not just about church people speaking to church people but we really have to listen to secular people we have to listen to people of faith people of no faith and pope francis says this is the first first of the two steps of the c judge act movement in laudato c Robert. okay Dr. Knox, thank you so much uh, i see mark you have your hand up as well uh, yeah. okay. please uh, uh, go ahead yeah, um, I'd just like to to ask, uh, since um, most of the people who are tuned in here are African, I would like just to find out uh, what African religion uh, has to say about um, the, the climate crisis. A number of theologians have made suggestions that uh, uh, following um, some of the, the teachings that we get from African religion, especially with the African initiated or instituted churches, we, we can get insights into um, what is happening to the planet. Because uh, some of the, the churches are, are found in slums and, and it's like they, are, they also leave uh, the ravages of uh, um, poverty. And as we know, the demographics, uh, the Catholic church is one, but um, it's just one of the voices that uh, speaks on this. So I just wanted to find out what uh, the, the African religion is saying about this or whether they've also bought into uh, the development model, which disregards, um, you know, the climate warning and just wants development, like, you know, prosper, uh, gain money and all that. And there isn't any dialogue going on on the other side. So I just wanted to find out what dialogue is happening are the Catholics the ones just talking about like that to see and 
what what's African religion saying about this? Uh, and not African religion, religion as it was in the past, but as it is lived out now through these um, um, African initiated churches and even through um, those who are doing the works of enculturation, even within the Catholic Church. Okay, thank you. Mark. Let's go ahead. There's, I don't see any other hand, so it's like the, that's the only question. Okay, thank you, Ndate. Um, certainly, Mark, I don't think we can dismiss entirely um, the African traditions before we consider African African religions, because African religions claim to be rooted in African traditions. And so when we're talking about modern African religions, we're also talking about where they come from. And African traditional religions has, all, as you know, all sorts of taboos, and this is a place where you may not go, or this is a place where you may, or this is a species of animal which you may not exploit. And there are all sorts of kind of ecology or environmentally related um, behaviors which are forbidden or tabooed. And then I think African, existing African religions really are part of the interreligious dialogue, which Pope Francis encourages. And the um, if they we're talking specifically about African initiated churches, they, they're Christian churches. So that's the level of ecumenism. And we have to be speaking as Catholics with all the people of all religions and no religions and other Christian religions. For the Since I've been here, I've been doing a fair amount of work with me Methodists in South Africa, and particularly the African Methodist Church, AME, African Methodist Episcopal Church in South Africa, and many of them are coming from a much less kind of academic environment than those who, those who belong to the Catholic Church, and African religions very often are unable to speak with a single voice. For example, in South Africa, we have well over 6,000 African initiated churches. And you can imagine the difficulty they have in speaking with a single voice. And so many of them, I'm, I'm presuming to say, many of them look to the Catholic church, which has a centralized teaching um, body. Uh, we should be going out more and speaking to other Christians and people of African traditional religions in saying, what have you got to teach us? Um, care for the environment. Pope Francis speaks about um, Aboriginal societies, traditional societies, societies which are in charge of and which own so much land and which are so protective of the land in which they live. Um, many many religions are able to, are sort of very localized and, and they're kind of relating to the land on which they live. Um, so the, both the encyclical and the exhortation say we have to engage with traditional society. Great. Thank you, Ndati. Any other question? I don't see any hand that is up or uh, any Queries. Uh, so we have reached the one hour, five minute mark. I don't know if there's anybody who wants to make a, sh a brief comment before we close. It's now or never. Opportunity going once, going twice, and gone. Dadenox, thank you so much. It has been very, it has been a very informative and interesting uh, uh, expose, and uh, we hope that uh, what you've shared with us uh, it will help uh, everybody who was in this uh, Zoom in this Zoom meeting to uh, go and uh, encourage others to work uh, uh, hard and start acting to take care of our common home if they haven't started yet, and. To everybody who has joined us this evening, thank you so much. On behalf of the Social Apostolate of the Society of Jesus, which is an umbrella body that encompasses all the works of the society, whose purpose is eradicating all social and environmental injustices that force many people to live in poverty and uh, continue to destroy uh, our common home, we 
like to thank you together with the Jesuit Institute and the JCED who collaborated with us uh, to bring this together. Thank you for joining us and be assured that we will invite you in future for more um, uh, webinars uh, of interest like these ones. Thank you, Ndati. Thank you, Knox. And uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you. Have a good